Today we have a special presentation with Ken. I think I had mentioned to you last week we have um, a vet from the Vietnam War speaking to us today. And this is um, in collaboration with the field trip that we're going to be taking on the 26th. Okay, my name is Ken Dettelbach. I'm a tour tour Vietnam combat vet. I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself quickly. Okay, I come from Cleveland, Ohio. Came out here 32 years ago. Uh, I actually came out uh, in 1970 uh, and then went back to Cleveland and did some business and came back out here in 88. Um, I have um, uh, 12 kids and grandkids, okay? Um, so we're, we're a pretty large family. Everybody here, I'm sure, does anybody have a large family here? Okay. So, um, um, and they're spread all over. Uh, they come out to Santa Fe quite often. Uh, and uh, um, my last name is Dettelbach, and uh, um, uh, Stephen Dettelbach yesterday was appointed as head of the Alcohol, Fire, uh, Tobacco, and Firearms Division of the Treasury in Washington. So, um, everybody's moving upwards. Um, the important thing for me to, let, to tell you about myself is that um, my dad uh, was a great outdoorsman and uh, during the summers I would go to the Teton Survival School at the Grand Tetons. It's a two-week school. The Tetons, if you know anything about them, start at 7,000 feet okay, and go up and there's nothing on top. So they put you up there to survive for two weeks and all you have is a knife and a flint. Okay, and uh, so I learned quite a bit about the outdoors. Uh, uh, out here I'm an avid fly fisher person, and my wife is a licensed guide and takes, uh, we take uh, um, PTSD patients from Kirtland Air Force Base uh, to the Pecos, and we take patients from Fort Carson, okay, uh, to the Canaeus River. Anybody know where the Canaeus River is in southern Colorado? Okay, so, um, um, and we put them in the river. Many of them have uh, artificial limbs. Uh, their wives come with them, and we have a day, and we catch fish. So it's instant gratification. Um, I want to tell you a little bit uh, about today, since I have you for two classes, or you have me for two classes. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about um, what, what we're going to do today. Um, since this is the New Mexico School for the Arts, we have a whole class and presentation on art in the military, which includes painting, cartoons, music, all created uh, because of war, from the various wars. We also have poetry. Um, so would anybody like to hear a simple poem. Okay, let me read it to you. You all studied the Second World War, or the First World War. Okay, and what was prevalent in the First World War was it was trench warfare, right? Okay, and you go from trench to trench to trench, but the soldier lived in the trench and he ate in the trench and he defecated in the trench, and the trenches became really stinky places, right? Well, there was this general by the name of Shoot. Don't forget that name, okay? And he uh, uh, came out to the trenches in the First World War in a brand new, beautiful uniform with the stars on and so forth. And he looked down in the trenches and he started berating all the soldiers about the trenches. And then after he had left, okay, a soldier wrote a poem about shoot. It's a little risque. Can I read it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You guys ready? The general inspecting the trenches exclaimed with a horrified shout, I refuse to command a division which leaves its excretia about. But nobody took any notice, no one was prepared to refute that the presence of shit was congenial compared with the presence of shoot. And certain responsible critics made haste to reply to his words, observing that his staff advisors consisted entirely of turds. For shit may be shot 
at odd, own, at, at, at odd corners and paper supply there to suit, but a shit would be shot without mourners if somebody shot that shit shoot. <laughs> This, uh, this is one of several poems uh, that we've uncovered in the First World War especially, okay? And there are a number of poems that have been written about this during the Vietnam War um, that um, I hope to be able to share with your teacher who can share with you at her discretion, okay? And I have a list of questions that's been created. In the middle of your table there, you have a map of Vietnam. Um, and I'll explain where I was and what the strategy was of the war in Vietnam. Uh, so don't hesitate to raise your hand. Um, and if you have uh, a, a personal discussions about how you lived or you're related, who's related to anybody who was in Vietnam? Okay. And who had family in the military? Okay, so this is a great military state, isn't it? Uh, and, and so we'll go forward with that. Um, I want to cover a few things first, okay? And, and, and what I'm going to cover has generalizations to many wars, okay? The, um, if we agree on something of how I approach my thought process, then maybe I can give you this thought process and you can use it if you want to. So. We have the history of our lives, correct? And that's a study of past events. And we have the present. Okay, who lives in the present? It just passed. It's a millisecond, right? Yeah. So the present never comes. It's all history that we're creating. And if we remember our history and use it, okay, which they do when they teach war at the war college, uh, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, um, then at that particular point, uh, um, you end up not using the present because the present is execution. So if I tell you that these are the ions of war, of life, um, the past is education and the present, okay, is implementation, right, of the past and the future never comes. We can think about it, but it's never here. So that's reconciliation of the past and the present, even though the present is a millisecond. So if we use that as a thought process as we talk about war or we talk about the Vietnam War, you'll hear me talk about the ions a little bit more as we move on. Fair enough? Okay. Um, and then when we talk about the Vietnam War, does anybody know what the mission was of the Vietnam War? Yeah, I have a vague idea. Huh? I, have, I think I have a vague idea. Well, what was it? Um, it was, I think Vietnam was being invaded by communists, and then the U.S. was scared that it would be like a domino effect. Vietnam fell, the next person fell. Right on target. Right on target. So they were like, we need to stop this. So we went into Vietnam to, to, to block and stop communism, all right? I don't think we did, but that was the mission of the Vietnam War. Um, in developing war thought, okay, you develop uh, logistics and tactics, so, and strategies. So you start with strategies and you move on, okay, to logistics to make those strategies happen. And logistics basically is getting everything to the front, supplies, materials, men, equipment, okay? And then the, the uh, um, tactics is the execution of it, all right? So we'll talk a little bit about what the mission statement was, but what, were the, what was the logistics? What was the purpose of how we set up Vietnam uh, as, a, as a war zone? And I can tell you, and I'll show you on the maps when I get to the maps, but basically the tactic was to have a central or a couple central um, supply bases called Benoit, Cameron Bay, you might have heard of them before, uh, Da Nang, um, 
and then have forward supply bases. Okay, my job in Vietnam, okay, I was a captain in Vietnam. Um, by the way, that's the best position to be in the Army is to be a captain because you command your own world uh, without too much interference. Um, and um, I was a captain, and companies in Vietnam had basically 176 men, 13 choppers. Everybody know what a chopper is? Okay, and um, uh, graves detail. Does everybody know what a graves detail is? Okay, so a graves detail is a, a group of uh, men within the company, okay, who are responsible when we get back to base, we ferried supplies in, we ferried bodies out. We ferried troops in, we ferried bodies out. When we got back to base, we had to package those bodies okay and ship them back uh, to the United States to their loved ones okay and um, which required a graves detail so I'm gonna read you a little bit about what somebody wrote about a graves detail is that okay so that you understand the emotional aspect of what people went through on a daily basis our typical day in Vietnam was not a day it was 24 hours and the reason was the only difference between day and night was sunshine. All right, so we learned to adjust ourselves accordingly from uh, the standpoint of sleep or command, what we call command. And in front of you, you've got a whole list of uh, vocabulary that you can study or you can take a look at so that you understand what some of these words mean that I'm talking about. So we all agree that we, we're going to talk about logistics and tactics um, uh, as definitions of, of the war. Um, military sayings. Okay, here we go. Um, and this, these are true sayings that we learn as we get educated to go up the ladder uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in rank uh, in the military. Infantry wins battles, logistics wins wars, all right? Now, if you want to talk about Ukraine today, everybody knows what's going on in Ukraine. Okay, why are the Russians losing? Not because they didn't have 10 times the military that the Ukrainians did. They're losing because uh, they uh, moved goods and services in Russia by railroad. That's how they moved them. They had an extensive railroad system. Okay, Belarus, where they went to, and Ukraine had only one railroad, and they moved things by trucks. But they couldn't move things by trucks because the tanks took up the roads. So they couldn't get goods to the front, goods and services, let alone people, to the front. And so Ukraine has done a great job of decimating them to the extent that they have today. Um, and uh, it's all because of logistics. Uh, logistics leads strategies. You develop your strategy and then you go and develop logistics behind it. How do you supply that strategy? And then technology determines tactics. We're going to talk a little bit about technology today, okay? Um, does everybody here know that uh, a sniper rifle can kill somebody one mile away? It used to be 300 yards. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the weapons. And then the unknown in this is time. How do you execute all this in time? Then the war triangle. Um, and if you have questions about any of this, don't hesitate. Um, I want this to be a discussion, okay, because every, everybody has their own thoughts, and they're not the same as everybody else. At least one thought is different. So express you if you want to. The war triangle. Um, so what is the one thing that you can produce, okay, that is not regenerated, that has no value after you use it? A bomb? Right? A bomb. You drop a bomb, okay, there's no use after that. You make a car, you got a lube job, you got repairs, you got tires, you got 
all kinds of things that that other goods and services pre reproduce and reproduce and create a, a payroll and all the other kind of things that it does. So let's talk about the fact that uh, the military had three quarters of a trillion dollars the last few years in developing boats and systems and bombs and, and javelin missiles, missiles and everything else like that. Okay, what happens if they're not used? What do they do with them? Put them in a warehouse, right? Okay, how many warehouses can they put them in? So every year, generally, the United States has been involved in a war. Uh, and I, I've given Isabella a, 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 a pamphlet on the wars of the United States, which... Which is really interesting to read because it tells you how many people were involved, the cost of the war, uh, if you take, you've studied the Revolutionary War? You haven't, okay. Um, World War I? I mean, you can stop there. Um, um, military deaths were 116,000, 53,000 in battle. Uh, we all studied World War I and we knew that uh, they packed the ships during the, uh, the epidemic People died in the ships when they went over, thousands. Um, wounded 204, total serving 4.73 million in World War I. When World War I started, there was only 15,000 people in the military. Um, and the cost was 20 billion. Well, of course, if you want to take that forward from 1917 to today, how much is 20 billion today? 120 billion, 420 billion, some huge number. So on all the wars, you have this information and it's sort of interesting to see how many people died in battle and how many people died out of battle. Half the people in World War I died out of battle. So anyways, okay. So we can go back to the triangle. Okay. So. You have the military, it's creating all of these goods that have no use but to, to blow up, right? Okay, then you got the government. So the government declares war, and the government military complex, okay, is extensive. Uh, uh, and the military employs people, right? So if you don't, if you cut back in the military and use that money somewhere else, then you have a different story, okay? Um, so the government, the politics of war, and in the Vietnam War, they were extensive. Um, I don't know if you can get a hold of it, but um, um, Nguyen Cao Ki, who was premier of Vietnam, and I'll talk about him in a little bit, but uh, he did a 10-tape, audio tape uh, program called Buddha's Child. And it's phenomenal, because he was Viet Cong, came down and ran the Air Force, okay, in South Vietnam, and then became premier of, of South Vietnam. He, he was brought over to the United States when we got out of there, and he opened a beauty shop. I guess that's war. Okay, so anyways, um, uh, but he tells it from the other side. He talks about the politics of war. And, and in Vietnam, we had great politics. Um, and then we had the people. When I came back from Vietnam, all the demonstrations, okay, we weren't liked as soldiers. We were told not to wear our uniforms, okay, because we would uh, be spit on. That's basically what they said, because we lost the war, so everybody thought. But the politics of Vietnam really lost the war. Um, well before 1964, um, North Vietnamese and South Vietnamese um, politicians were in Paris negotiating a settlement, and they did settle at the 17th parallel, just like in Korea, okay? And nobody adhered to it, neither the French, okay, nor the Americans. What was the first year the United States was in Vietnam? Anybody know? Give me a guess. Somebody give early, me a, Huh? Early 60s. Say again? Early 60s. 
know. Early 60s? That's my guess. 1948, we had expeditionary forces in Vietnam assisting the French who were colonializing Vietnam. But if you look at the history of Vietnam, which I'm not going to get into, um, they were never, they were always attacked by the Chinese and other people, but they never lost. Okay, even though some people uh, stayed in their country for years and years, but they never lost. And why didn't they lose? Because basically their life was a plot of land next to a river. Okay, and um, only certain sections of Vietnam are really inhabitable. So they grew up in the land, they lived on the land, they were buried on the land, uh, they cultivated the land, so uh, they were strong as a family. Um, and I think we see some of that in, in Ukraine, the family relationships, and how that created a, a defense for the people of, of, of uh, uh, Ukraine. So you have the military, the government, and the people. These are who determine war. And they have different reasons, different politics, uh, different goals. Um, so um, does anybody know why we went to war in World War II? Pearl Harbor. Say again? Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. Anybody else? Okay, we went to war in World War II because of Pearl Harbor. Uh, that was the final straw. But what we did to the Japanese is we squeezed their resources and cut them off from oil. What are we doing in, in Ukraine and Europe? Much of the same. In 1931, the Japanese invaded China. In 1938, they really put a million people, 1,100,000 people in China, okay, to, to control the Chinese and to harvest whatever they wanted from the Chinese because they needed resources in Japan, and China had great resources. Um, so what happened was um, you had a million one hundred thousand Japanese in China during the Second World War. I want you to think about something. What happened, what would happen if those million one hundred thousand uh, Japanese were not in China and were fighting the Americans? Would it have changed things? It could have. It could have very well. And some people write about that. You know, I'll go back to the Indian Wars of the West. Okay, There were 600 languages that the Indian, uh, the, Indian the Native Americans spoke all over the, uh, the Western country, in the Eastern country. Think if they had had one language and one leader. What would have happened? regardless of that the, they didn't for a period of time have repeating rifles but I want you to think about these things okay because resources um, is they said we went into Iraq for resources right for oil uh -uh. resources is a big thing um, uh, when it comes to wars any questions okay am I telling you things that are interesting no oh, okay I'll keep going <laughs> Um, I'm getting a paid a lot to do this, you know. So. <laughs> um, and, you know, one of the questions that somebody asked me privately, they said, why are you doing this? Okay, I want every one of you to understand about war. I want every one of you to understand uh, the Vietnam War, the, the futility of why 59,000 of us died and why 1,500 um, MIAs, missing in action, were never found. Um, I want you to understand um, our allies, and we'll talk about our allies in Vietnam, were South Korea and Australia, um, um, and uh, us in the United States, uh, and the North Vietnamese, uh, had three different levels of soldiers. They had the NVA, which is the North Vietnamese Army. Uh, they were well equipped by China. China kept supplying them. Uh, so you've heard of the Kalashnikovs or the AK-47s. Uh, they came from China. And then we had uh, uh, the Viet Cong. Everybody know the name Viet Cong or VC? 
Do you know who they were? They were guerrillas in the South. They were guerrillas in the South. Um, and then we had the porters, thousands and thousands and thousands of porters, came down two trails. You've heard of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, right? But how many have heard of the Sihanouk Trail? And I'm going to show you the Sihanouk Trail, which was more prevalent in moving goods than even the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We'll discuss and I'll show you some pictures of porters. And then I'm going to show you some personal pictures of mine next time. Does anybody want to see my personal pictures? Maybe that will get good attendance, huh? Okay. But they're pretty interesting. And um, so I want to talk about a little bit about commonalities of wars. And I'll go through this real quick because it affects the Vietnam War. Um, when would, did the United States first use guerrilla warfare? And a definition of guerrilla warfare is on the sheets on the centers of your table. All right. And basically it's little guys, little bands of guys running around, okay? The difference between guerrilla warfare and ordinary warfare is they can choose where they want to fight instead of the enemy choosing where they want to fight. And it's very effective in Ukraine today, the ambush of tanks and all kinds of other things. So let's talk about guerrilla warfare. When was it first started? What was the first war that it was in? Okay. Did Washington cross the Delaware? He didn't stay home for Christmas, right? He had a group of guys crossing the Delaware. That was the first... There was also guerrilla warfare at Lexington and so forth, but that was the first evidential uh, uh, show of guerrilla warfare during the Revolutionary War. And then in the Civil War, okay, we had a, a lot of guerrilla warfare from the South. Um, and uh, there's a whole litany of articles and books written, okay, on guerrilla warfare in, 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 in the Civil War. Yes, sir? Uh, why is it called guerrilla warfare? Say again? Why is it called guerrilla warfare? Um, um, that's a good question. Uh, I think it's called guerrilla warfare because it it gives it an image. All right. Uh, um, it's, uh, guerrilla warfare is a very effective kind of warfare, and it's been involved in all of our wars. The Native Americans, okay, were great at guerrilla warfare. They didn't call it that, but uh, they had warring parties, right? And those warring parties, okay weren't uh, riding across planes of land uh, and attacking until they see the whites of the eyes, right? Okay, what they were doing is they were attacking in areas that you wouldn't expect or, or the U.S. military didn't expect them to attack, and they were very effective. Um, there's a movie called um, Defending the Fire, created by Silver Bullet Productions. I have that movie. Um, <laughs> Isabella keeps looking at me and all the things I have. Um, and it talks about all the great chiefs from Big Bear to Geronimo to whatever and how they trained their people to be warriors. And those warriors, in the, in the Vietnam War, there were 17,000 Native Americans. I'm sorry. In the First World War, there were 17,000 Native Americans fighting for the United States. Some people say, well, why would why did they want to fight for the United States when the United States was beaten up on them, right? But there's some good reasons for that, because uh, um, they were patriots, really, underneath. And then in the Vietnam War, there were 50,000 Native Americans that were fighting. So um, they learned guerrilla warfare, uh, and they were trained to do so. This movie takes it. Um, the Native American community up to the present time, and who's in the military now uh, that uh, is, um, has been determined to be a great warrior, okay? And it shows some things. It's really very interesting. The fire, if you know, know anything about Native American culture, but the fire was everything. It told everything. So the fire talked. And so defending the fire is why the movie was called as such. Um, in Ukraine, you had snipers. What's very interesting is um, I have a movie on snipers, and um, 
the advent of snipers even going forward to Ukraine today, if you read about Ukraine, snipers are very effective in Ukraine in killing people. And war is about killing people. So, um, um, in, in, in China in, in, in 1937, Japan, okay, was tied up, and China went to guerrilla warfare. Also, everybody remember, you know, uh, uh, McCarthy, uh, um, it wasn't McCarthy, who was it? Uh, who said, I'll be back? I think he said McCarthy. No, I don't know. It was a general, I, I lost it. Oh, sorry. No, who? <laughs> who was it? I'll be back. Huh? I thought that was, I'll be back. Yeah. Terminator. In the Philippines. Who? who? Yeah. So, anyways, so our, our army left the Philippines um, because the Japanese were overpowering the army, our army, and the Philippine people went to guerrilla warfare. And so the generals came back and the army came back because guerrilla warfare was effective in the Philippines. And um, in Vietnam, the Viet Cong were very effective at guerrilla warfare. We were not, okay? And therefore, our strategy in Vietnam was very simple, okay? You have main bases, correct? Uh, and I'll show you where the main bases is, and I have pictures of them. They covered acres and acres and acres of all supplies and so forth. And then you had forward supply bases. So you'd fly from the main base to the forward supply bases with goods and services, and those were basically 240 meters in circumference. Some of them held 5,000 people. Um, if you ever get a chance to study the Battle of Khe Sanh, K-H-E-S-A-N-H, -E in Vietnam, um, 5,000 Marines lost a tremendous amount of their personnel at that forward supply basis. Anybody ever hear of Dien Bien Phu? The French, the French got decimated. They lost 17,000, okay? And that's why they left Vietnam, and that's, you know, left it to the United States to take over. So, um, uh, we'll talk about, a little bit about that. Trench warfare, when was it, when did we first really start trench warfare in the United States? World War One? Huh? No. Civil War. No, no. <laughs> no, it's Civil War. The Battle of Vicksburg. Oh. Oh. In the Civil War. Oh. <laughs> uh, the Battle of Vicksburg was basically, Vicksburg was basically in, in, impenetrable, and the Union Army couldn't get to it. It fought them for 21 days be and making no headway at all. So they dug a trench, and the trench went basically um, from the, the river, Mississippi River, to Vicksburg, um, and it went under the command post of the Union Ar of the uh, Confederate Army, and they blew up the command post, and then they got into Vicksburg. So that was the first trench. And then, of course, we had Civil War trenches. Uh, in Vietnam, we had trenches. Uh, we didn't fight for those trenches, but we had to dig those trenches. And then you also know. You've heard of the Coochie Tunnels in Vietnam? Those were tunnels that the Viet Cong um, and the North Vietnamese created whole cities underground. Hospitals, schools, um, and I'll show you some pictures of the Coochie Tunnels. Um, um, I would say that, to be honest with you guys, I, I couldn't go down in them because they're extremely claustrophobic until you get these vast expenses of space, but we'll we'll take a look at it. Did they hand dig all of the trenches? Say again. Trenches? Did they hand dig everything? Or did they yes. Dig We're going to talk about the porters. Okay. Every, they they didn't have bulldozers. Yeah. Okay, and they didn't have tanks to begin with. So, anyways, um, uh, and World War One, of course, had trenches. Ukraine has trenches. You can see them digging trenches in Ukraine. Uh, and then we'll talk about guns really a, a little bit, okay? In the West, the Gatling gun came to be. And what happened in Vietnam? We outfitted a C-47 with, uh, with three Gatling guns, 
they were a little bit different, but we could put a bullet every square foot of a football field, okay, the width of a football field. So they were very effective. Today, if you study the C-130s, um, we call ours uh, Puff the Magic Dragons or Snoopies, uh, the C-47s, okay, who had Gatling guns. Today, the C-130s are called the same thing, but their Gatling guns put a grenade, okay, every so many feet. Uh, and so they're mu much more powerful than, than what we had. But ours were very effective. And I'll show you pictures of C-47s and um, my best friend uh, who is still alive today um, in Vietnam, J Jim Lawler, he was a Boston uh, college graduate, um, flew the C-47s and I went with him a lot. Okay, so is that interesting? Okay, tell me if it's not. I'm, I'm thick-skinned. I'm thick-skinned. Does he still live in Vietnam? Say again. Does he still live in Vietnam? No, no, no. Uh, um, um, I'm going to pass some memorabilia around to you uh, in the second class. All right. And I, I brought over a Vietnamese boy. He was nine years old. Okay. And I left him there when I left. Okay. And got him over here. Uh, he was with, with me during the whole war. Okay, he protected me. Um, I spoke Vietnamese, but uh, not as good. Nine years old, nine year old Vietnamese kids uh, were capable of anything that a 25 year old could do to here today. Okay, in terms of utilizing weapons, um, intelligence. He, he kept everything away from us and warned us uh, of uh, uh, impending actions because he could travel. I mean, he, he could move around, okay? Um, uh, so in the Vietnam War, you had the NVA, the North Ver uh, I don't know if we have a slide on that, North Vietnamese Army. You had the Viet Cong, the VC. They were South Vietnamese guerrillas. And you had the porters, thousands and thousands of porters. I'm going to show you some pictures of porters. Okay, every porter could carry 55 pounds on his back. And if he had a bicycle that he controlled with a bamboo stick, okay, going hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of miles through the jungles of, of, of Laos and Cambodia into Vietnam, okay, and on the Sihanouk Trail going through Cambodia and getting on boats and coming all the way around uh, Vietnam. I'll show you those maps. Um, I can, and then in the south you had the Arvin, the uh, Army of, of Vietnam, uh, uh, and you had the South Koreans and Australians, and you had us. And you hear a lot about partnerships in war, you know, with other countries. Okay. Well, in Vietnam, um, our partnerships only had seven to fifteen thousand men. Keep in mind, in Vietnam. Going through Vietnam, we had two million men uh, and women. There were 7,000 women uh, uh, as um, soldiers in Vietnam, okay? And they had two million men. The most we had in country at any one time was 550,000. Uh, that was built up in a period of four years or five years. Um, and. Uh, does every, and everybody remember how the Vietnam War started and why we decided to, to go to war besides the communist thing? Uh, you may, in, in Haiphong Harbor, which is North Vietnam, one of our boats was blown up. Nobody could prove it really was the North Vietnamese that did it, uh, any more than in the Spanish-American War, which I don't know if you studied, uh, when they blew up the Maine. Okay, nobody can prove that it was the, the Spanish that blew up the Maine. So, um, and I'm not saying one way or the other, but that was the kickoff of why we needed to support Vietnam. So we were there with an army in the south, the army of the Arvin, Army of South Vietnam, and we trained them. And I'll show you some pictures. Okay, we trained them in, in, in um, uh, uh, aviation. Uh, we trained them to use 
our AR-16s, which were, were new at that time, uh, uh, going from the M class, the M15 class, much better rifle. But the best rifle over there that anybody had uh, was the AK-47 or Kalashnikov. That's still a great rifle today. Um, okay. Everybody up to date? Okay. Um, I'm not going to spend, let me, let me see if I can, uh, I bought a, a, bought a, I bought a laser pointer, but it doesn't work on this port, so. Oh, yeah. Okay. So anyways, um, if you take a look at North Vietnam, okay, here's the 17th parallel. Uh, this is South Vietnam, that's North Vietnam. Uh, you can see how close China is uh, to it. Um, this is Laos, this is Thailand, this is Cambodia. Most of our planes that bombed the Ho Chi Minh Trail, we flew out of Thailand and not out of Vietnam. The B-52s, okay, for example. Um, anyways, everybody okay with this so far? Okay. So, um, you had um, Da Nang, uh, you had uh, um, 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 Cameron Bay, doesn't show on here, but it was right here. Kinoam, these were all uh, spots on the ocean that we brought our goods into, our goods and services into. Um, you had the city of Natrang. You'll see pictures of me in Natrang. Natrang was off limits to any bombing by the north or the south. And it was set up by the French. And Natrang is a city of uh, beautiful, you know what an antebellum house is? It's a beautiful house with two levels and all kinds of filigree and stuff on it. And it's a southern house. But antebellum type houses in the Trang, um, French restaurants in, in the Trang during the war, uh, uh, this beach along Vietnam, six billion dollars have been put into resorts on that beach in the last two years. Okay, because it's the most extensive, most fabulous beach I've ever been to and I've been around. So it was off limits in the Trang, and we trained the, the South Vietnamese Army in the Trang, especially in aviation. Um, uh, Saigon was down here, and you have maps in front of you, okay? And you'll look at the maps in front of you, and you'll see, um, you'll, you'll locate by core, you see four cores. One core, I core, two core, three core, and four core. I was in three corps, all right, and my main base was Benoit, and we'll show you pictures of Benoit, all right, and we flew from Benoit to little cities just a little bit up the map called Phu Vinh and Phu Loi, and they were two forward supply bases that we supplied. Um, oh, here we are. You're pretty good. <laughs> okay. uh, here's um, uh, um, uh, Phu Loi. Okay, and Phuc Vinh, P-H-O-U-C, or U-O-C, Y-I-N-H, Vinh, okay? And um, Benoit was right here, so we constantly flew, okay, to, to there. Uh, Chi was a forward supply base, a uh, forward supply base. Zhang Bei, Ben Mi Tu, um, uh, and then you could go all the way up and uh, have forward supply bases. So they were constantly supplied by the Transportation Corps. I was C Company, 4th Transportation Battalion. I was a Transportation Corps officer. Um, and the Transportation Corps had responsible responsibility for rotary, okay, which are helicopters, uh, until uh, the tandem seat helicopter, one behind the other, the Cobra. I don't know if you ever heard of the Cobra. But the Huey helicopter was never meant to be an armament platform. And so on the Huey, we had 60 caliber, 50 caliber, and 30 caliber machine guns. Uh, and we had up to 76 2.75 inch rocket launchers, rockets in GE rocket launchers. Um, that was what they armed the Huey with. It was a very effective machine, by the way. So anyways, do you understand where I was? Okay, and this whole picture, uh, and we'll talk about Vietnam in terms of its 
climate and its logistics um, as we move forward. By the way, this is a, a, a negative ionizer. Does everybody know what a negative ionizer is? <coughs> um, my older son is a biophysicist and worked on the Pfizer vaccine. Okay, a, the, uh, the COVID is a, um, a positive iron, ion, I-O-N. Okay, it's a positive iron. And uh, bacteria is a positive iron. Uh, if you hit a positive iron with a negative iron, ion, okay, it drops to the ground. All right, and doesn't die. So you don't use this in the house because you'd have all this stuff if you had this stuff in the house, okay? Uh, but what it does is it puts a circumference of three feet around you, okay, and basically um, takes care of anything that's in the air. So it's called a negative ionizer. So if you Google negative ionizer, you'll see all kinds of, of stuff, okay? Um, but in um, the Second World War, we were using piston engines, same in Korea. We had a few jets in Korea. And then in Vietnam, we, we had uh, uh, Mach 2 jets and from Mach 1 jets. And we, had, we learned how to fight the war with, with uh, uh, helicopters. So the advance in technology. And then I'll talk a little bit about the ra radar systems, which is sort of interesting. Um, okay. Is there another map that we have? That, or is that the only one? I think I think if we go to um, uh, yeah okay um, let's let's take a break from me um, doesn't mean we can leave the room I'm kidding um, and let's talk about some questions I want you to ask questions of me um, and these questions were developed by one of this class by this class. Okay, so is it okay if we start going through some of your questions? Okay, have I brought you up to a point where I'm going to go in to explain and show you several slides, and then at the next class, we'll dwell on my personal stuff? Fair enough? Okay. Um, um, what rank did I hold? Well, I, I was a captain, okay. Um, uh, um, did your perspective on the war change over time? Um, uh, yes, when I got home, I was an anti-war activist. Um, and uh, I went around to the high schools. Yes? Yeah, uh, I guess I have a question then about that. If, like, did the other anti-war people who had been protesting the war while you were in Vietnam, I guess how did they, how were they receptive to like you joining? Okay, you're going to re repeat the question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, how were the other like anti war protesters, um, like how did they take the news of you going to war? Yeah, like how. how okay, did they react it's a fair question. A it's a fair question. Um, when I got back from Vietnam, uh, um, I had PTSD. Uh, I uh, was in the Agent Orange program. How many people have heard of Agent Orange? Okay, and I'll explain exactly what it was, or what it is, okay? And um, uh, everybody had a, a different way of uh, presenting themselves anti-war-wise, all right? My anti-war effort was basically going talking to the high schools uh, and talking about the war. And I had my pictures and stuff like that and so forth. And, and I talked about the military, uh, uh, the triangle. Remember the triangle that I showed you guys? Okay, and I talked about that. So, so these, especially the seniors, they're getting to be your age, right? Okay, there was a draft, right? So they were all thinking what to do. Uh, I had buddies that went to Canada, okay? One of the questions is, why did you go to war? Why didn't you go to Canada? Uh, and... Uh, um, it, to me, it was very simple. It wasn't, it wasn't about uh, freedom and the United States and communism that I went to war. It was the fact that I was trained to do things where other people would die if I didn't go. 
So they would be taking my spot. And I couldn't live with that. I couldn't rationalize the fact that um, if, if, if I knew somebody who was in my position over there that died, and I'm going to pass around a picture at the second class of me presenting the Silver Star to Anna Marie Brainerd, her husband Fleming was a, a captain in Vietnam, as I was, okay, and uh, um, so it was the second s Silver Star, I'm dating myself, it was the second Silver Star uh, presented in, uh, in the Vietnam War, so you know how far back it went. Yes, sir? Uh, would you still consider yourself anti-war? Do you still consider yourself anti-war? Um, I'm neutral. In, in reality, um, um, I'm thinking about today's events, okay, and what we might have to do. Um, um, seeing that my relative are in Washington, and um, I'm concerned about it. Um, uh, we have a tremendous arsenal of military goods, tremendous arsenal of military goods. I'm just concerned that that uh, it's too easy to pull the trigger and not do everything else not to. So um, I'm not I'm not pro-war. I'm not anti-war today. Uh, uh, what I am is uh, um, thoughtful. Keep in mind one thing. Hold on one sec. Keep in mind one thing. Uh, when you're at war and you're in a commanding position, okay, when you're at war, you think about only one thing, okay? You think about the present. You use the f past, but you think about the present. You are obligated to keep everyone alive. There were 19 soldiers, six of six, seven, seven of them were 17 years old that died in my company. Um, and you always think that they die because of you. Or, and there were uh, about 30 that were injured, severely injured. Uh, and that's a revolving thing. It's not just one set of people. And when I came back, um, I spoke about the war in a way that was no, not totally anti-government. And I also visited every family of the 19 and spent some time. And that was the toughest thing I ever had to do because from an emotional standpoint, um, um, if you read about me in, in the, uh, um, and I'm gonna read a little bit about it. How much time we got left? Um, 20 minutes. Okay. So, We'll answer a few more questions, and we'll answer the rest at the next session. Fair enough? Okay, because I want to I read you guys some stuff. Um, uh, how was life after being drafted? I was ROTC, so I wasn't drafted. I, I chose my road, and I had to live with it, okay? Uh, what happened after the war ended with your personal life? Were you still in the military? No, I got out of the military. I wasn't uh, totally whole, okay? Um, uh, there was some addiction, um, and uh, who's from New Mexico? Okay, so you know where Dulce is, you know where the Hickories are, okay? So uh, I came out in 1970 to New Mexico and didn't stop at go, didn't stop to see my family. My daughter was born four days before I left, so I hadn't seen her, but I got together, my brother got me and I got together and went back to Cleveland, Ohio. Anybody ever been in Cleveland, Ohio? Have you really you've been in Cleveland, Ohio? Well, would you rather live in Santa Fe or Cleveland? <laughs> okay, all right, all right. So, um, uh, uh, but Cleveland's a pretty good town, okay? Um, anyways, uh, uh, I came out here, then I went back to Cleveland, okay? Made, made a little bit of money and came back out here in 88, because this is where I wanted to live. Uh, New Mexico is a phenomenal state. Um, if you study the history of New Mexico, um, whether it be the Mescalero Wars or whether you or, or or you look at uh, 
of the advent of Silver City today as a resort, and Las Cruces as a resort area. Um, uh, people come to New Mexico for different reasons, but um, how many people have been in Artesia? Okay, so food is made different in Artesia, okay, than it is in Silver City or in Raton, okay, or in Dulce, okay, so, or in the Four Corners, or in Santa Fe. So it's, New Mexico was settled by a whole variant of people, uh, and those, uh, uh, those people's traditions still live today. So, um, uh, I told you what an average or normal day was like. Uh, did you have any friends or relationships with the people you fought with? Yes, I still do today. I was f so lucky. My, my commanding officer, Leo Paisecki, okay, drove for General Eisenhower in the Second World War. Am I dating myself? Okay. Um, um, drove for General Eisenhower in the Second World War. And constantly he would have stories and stories and stories. Uh, he was General Eisenhower's driver. Uh, and he himself kept a diary. Uh, I have a portion of it. And um, uh, so his commanding officer, uh, Colonel Shanavert, okay, was younger than Leo Paisecki. So there was a little bit of a conflict there. Uh, but anyways, um, uh, um, our, our relationships, my relationship with Jim Waller, who flew the C-47s, okay, we're constantly talking about stories. I don't talk too much about um, the use of a gun or other kinds of things like that. Uh, because it, it, it has no ending, it, it's, it's final. And it, it doesn't prove anything. Um, maybe you'll, you'll study the My Lai Massacre, I don't know if you will, in, when you get to Vietnam. But uh, uh, when they went to body count, okay, as a way of proving that the war was a good thing, when the government did that, okay, there were a lot of people killed that didn't have to be killed. And I'll just leave it at that. Uh, um, how was our loved ones affected by the war? I will tell you, when we take um, veterans, whether it be Afghan or, or, or Iraqi veterans or whatever, uh, fly fishing, um, that their wives, we insist their wives come, and the wives are sometimes more affected than the veterans. They didn't buy into necessarily all the things that are going on when those veterans come home. And some wives are very good. Um, did I stay in contact with my family? Yeah, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, I did, I made tapes. But tapes in those days was those little round things that went around on a tape recorder. And I sent them home, uh, along with letters and so forth and so on. And I asked my older son, Michael, We're, we are a very close family today. So we talk every third Tuesday, we talk around the country on a Zoom, okay? And even, the, even my grandkids, I got five grandkids in college, so we even, we insist everybody get on. Okay, I'm not gonna leave them anything. Um, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, that was a joke. Um, but, <laughs> but, but the point that I wanted to make was that, um, uh, I got 10 minutes left, huh? Okay. All right. So um, let me move on. If you have questions, we'll talk about the questions. Um, you're ready for a little bit of an emotional time? If you're not emotional already? Okay. So we're going to talk about something. This is an insert that was created uh, for Santa Fe, New Mexican, about three Veterans Days ago when I helped put the insert together. Okay, um, and I'm on page 11, all right? I was a pretty good looking guy in those days. Um, uh, anyways, I'm gonna read you, uh, this is John Heinrichs, okay? He wrote, but it didn't prepare us for when we returned home to Oakland, California, where we were told not to wear our army uniforms. 
as protesters would berate us when they saw us in uniform. The protesters also made it important for us to quickly put aside our emotions and memories of the war. Those buried memories and emotions took a toll on relationships, so the war damage continued for many years. Um, I feel privileged to have served my country. I earned a bronze star, um, but my daughter was a victim of the war and our relationship. So that's, uh, um, that's one, okay. In my brief three years in the Army, I was in the worst of the Cold War in Berlin and then part of a helicopter battalion in Chu Lai, Vietnam, okay. I'll point, you, point it out later. Uh, the battalion included Aero Rifle Platoons, Cobra gunships, Tandem Seat gunships. They were armament platforms and Hueys, okay, the HUB-1Bs we talked about. Um, we covered the demilitarized zone and across in the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and we even went into Cambodia. Uh, in addition to flying front seat on Cobra gunships, I was ultimately assigned to the role of battalion adjutant. Part of my role as adjutant was to prepare letters for the commander's signature sent to parents and loved ones uh, of those who were lost in combat. We were located right on the South China Sea, and became a regular target for incoming rocket fire from the enemy as they attempted to take out our helicopters. We lost a number of choppers from enemy fires, weather conditions, and mistakes, um, uh, and uh, to the daily rocket barrages. And we didn't realize in the high level, and this is important, the high level of adrenaline that we experienced on a day-to-day -day basis would be difficult to deal with when we returned home. Many of us deal with post-traumatic stress disorder as a result. Um, is that interesting? Um, um, while on patrol conducting, this is, uh, this is Art Varela. These are all Santa Feans, by the way. Uh, while on, some of them live, some of them don't. While on patrol conducting search and destroy missions, aside from continually looking over our shoulders for enemy sniper fire and landmines, we had to contend with ubiquitous swarms of mosquitoes. When you took a shower in Vietnam during monsoon season, you didn't towel off because it was 100% humidity. It didn't make a difference. And we had to contend with ubiquitous swarms of mosquitoes, leeches that would tenaciously cling, cling to one's body and body organs because they would invade you, uh, the leeches, poisonous snakes, and filthy streams and rivers. Okay, and I only have a couple of minutes left, right? Okay, and I just want to tell you something. Who likes snakes? You like snakes? You really like yeah. snakes? Okay. In, 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 in South Carolina, the state with the most poisonous snakes, there's six poisonous snakes. In Vietnam, there are 200 snakes. 50 of them are poisonous. Okay? The most poisonous one was the crate, the Malaysian crate. We call it a two-step snake. 4,000 of our soldiers died in Vietnam from snake bites. You could take two steps before you died when the crate bit you. Okay, and so and and they hung from trees. Okay, so you're going through the brush and you're constantly looking around for snipers and all this other kind of stuff, and then you're looking for snakes. And the only way the crate, whose mouth only opens that big, could get you would be in a fleshy area. Okay, so a lot of the patrols uh, wore, <laughs> wore towels. Okay, around their neck to cover their earlobes. Okay. And so, um, but everybody was afraid of snakes. And um, would you all like me to go at the next session into all the booby traps that were set? Okay. Sure. Um, and we'll talk about the terrain a little bit. Okay. We'll talk about the boat people. We'll talk about the porters. If, if the porter had a bike, he could take 120 pounds. If not, it was 55 pounds. We'll talk about the Sienuk Trail. Nobody's ever heard of. Um, uh, you've heard of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, uh, but the Sienuk Trail uh, was very active, and I was active at that trail. So, anyways, we're we're at the end of the first session. Uh, did did I keep your interest? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. The the next one is going to be more moving. Okay. So. How old were you when you got back home? Ooh. Uh, twenty eight. I won't tell you how old I am now, <laughs> but uh, I was 28 when I got back home, um, and I'm going to read you some statistics at the next next session. Yes, ma'am. Um, how did the nine-year-old boy get the information? Yeah. How did the nine-year-old boy get the information? 
He went out into the countryside. He was outside the perimeter. Okay? I'm going to show you pictures of Tan. Um, the interesting thing is, let me just show you this. This is 51 years old. This is Tan's letter to me after I had left. I'm going to pass it around, not today, but the next time so you can read it. Uh, Ken, how are you and family? You, you go come back America. I think you are a boy very good because you talk with me, you go to Hanoi. You are VC. <laughs> he, was, he was mad at me. You go by plane to come Da Nang because you needed. See him 20 friend. Okay? Very fine. Why you talked with me, you go America. I about 15 days come America too. But I stay here now and I go to school. I am learning English. Good like to you. I am very busy all time. I wish you always very fine. Okay? And, uh, uh, um, uh, I hope see you again soon. I know I will. I shall tell you with after I shall be had, you're okay. Nguyen Tan Khan. Okay? And then my friend Jim Waller wrote, Ken, I told you, I think I told you this. Tan found his uncle on Christmas Day. His uncle put him in school. So Tan is our weekend house guest. Ten speaks. Okay. So anyways, you can read this as I pass that around because it goes further. But, uh, uh, Tan is now in California. He's got a business. He's a little, he's a little older than you guys. Uh, we, we talk all the time in English, <laughs> and uh, um, he's uh, uh, he's quite a man when he was quite a boy. And I'll have pictures of Tan holding guns, and uh, uh, his sole job was to protect Jim Lawler and myself. We we hooch together. You know what a hooch is? It's it's a bedroom, right? Um, we hooched together along with Jim Paisa uh, Leo Paisaki. So we were all very close over there, and we maintained that closeness over here. So I hope you really enjoyed the session. I tried to convey as much as I could uh, my personal experiences, but when you see the slides, you'll see better personal experiences next year, next time. Okay, any other questions while we're just sitting here? One minute. I read the time wrong. We have um, nine minutes. <laughs> oh, we, oh, you read the time wrong? Yeah. Oh, okay. So Ten I continue for nine minutes? Yeah. Okay, well, you guys just want to play doh. How come I didn't get a play doh? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> uh, he wanted to write you in English, so here it is. I hope you can make it all out. I can't believe it or not, it is Tom's writing, if you can manage it. He would like a picture of you and your family. Take a picture with $10 camera you had sent from Japan. Would you believe 66 days? P has, uh, Paiseki, P has 25, that's when they're gonna leave. Hey Kenny, how about sending the thermos back? When we left, uh, um, I, I wrote a, 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 a Skymaster back to the United States, which is, you know, web seating on the side. You know, you've seen pictures of the big planes and, and so forth and so on. And so, so the boys made me a, a, a thermos of uh, martinis. Okay. And by the way, the Vietnam, the, the Vietnam martini is not made like a normal martini with vodka or, or, or gin and, and uh, uh, vermouth. It's, uh, we couldn't get vermouth in Vietnam, so we made our martinis with vodka, gin, and scotch. Really? It was also good for athletes' foot. No, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. Okay, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, and be sure to autograph the thermos. I'll send it to me when he gets back. Then we'll pass it around for years. But what better token could we have? Over. Okay? So um, uh, then the sacred vial that sustained us in our final hour. That was the thermos. Our coup de grace to Vietnam. Our passport from exile. Yes, pass on the sacred vial that for the privileged three held that bomb of freedom, life's true blood, the divine nectar, the beverage that confers, immortality, the drink of the gods, gin. Hey, Ken, how about that? It must be the gin tonics I had at lunch. Take care. Okay, Jim. Okay, so he wrote it from Tan. And so I, I can pass this around today if you'd like and take a look at it. Be careful. I need it back.
Should we okay. Go to the next class because there's play doh. Huh? Their hands yeah, might be oily from the play doh. That's okay. I mean, just be careful. Okay. I had it. I've had it for fifty some years. Um, I'll also show you next time a pass that we had to use in Vietnamese to go from one core to another. There's four cores, remember? And we'll pass that pass around. If you didn't have that pass, they would shoot you on sight. So that pass was to be used by Arvin, the Army of South Vietnam. Uh, and when you went from one core to another, not up in the air, but on the ground, uh, it was, um, it was uh, something that you needed to use. Um, from the standpoint of uh, the Vietnamese people, let's talk about them for a minute. Um, think about this for a minute. I want everybody to think about this. Um, who are our allies today? Our allies are Japan, right? Germany. Who did we fight wars against? Japan and Germany. And who did we lose thousands of Americans against? Okay. Um, Australia is an ally, and they've been a good ally. England's been a good ally. Okay. But most of you don't know um, um, uh, if you ever want to study the wars of Cambridge, which are not written probably anywhere. Um, a lot of Americans went to Cambridge College in England. There were 30 colleges. Uh, the war broke out between the 30 colleges and the Americans and the English. So that war is not recorded. Okay? And I'm talking about a real war. And this was right at, on college present at the, between the buildings of the colleges. Um, but the Vietnamese people are phenomenal. If uh, um, I had been younger. Uh, it was a country that was growing. There were 25 million people when I was there. Now there's 100 million. Okay, they have great resources, both minerals and otherwise. A great, they're number six in rubber production. Um, and uh, they have a kind of rubber. There's different kinds of rubber, just like there is different kinds of oil. Okay, and so people value the rubber that comes out of the Vietnamese trees. And also from... Uh, uh, the standpoint of, of family, um, there was a great amount of uh, um, uh, uh, French cohabitation when the French were there. So there was a significant number of Vietnamese French uh, people. Um, and um, the Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese did not want this war. And the North Vietnamese, the difference between the South and the North was very simple. Uh, those in the South that were in war, including us in the American military, were designated for 13 months on a tour. That was our tour time. The Vietnamese, North Vietnamese, were in war for a lifetime. Don't come back to Hanoi, okay, unless you take South Vietnam. And millions of Vietnamese were killed because of that reason. Um, the diaries were taken off, I'm going to read you next time, uh, about a diary that was taken off a North Vietnamese who had a wife and children, the letters in the diary, um, I can't wait to see you, I want to be home, I don't like what I'm doing, you know, the whole thing. So they're no different, they were no different than us in a, from a mental standpoint. But, uh, and the purpose of the war, uh, if anybody can come up with a real purpose, I, w I would really like to know, uh, without getting too political. Um, but the people, uh, they were great cooks. Anybody eaten at a, Vietnam, a Vietnamese restaurant? It's pretty good food. Do you ever, you know a thing called nook mom? Yeah. You know what nook mom is? Does everybody know what nook mom is? It's not, it's nook mom, not nook dad. Okay? It's nook mom. Okay? And it's a sauce. It's a fish sauce that is put on everything. Vietnamese, but it's a phenomenal taste, and uh, so some of the Vietnamese restaurants in, in, in New Mexico do it right, and some don't. Um, Who does but, it right? <laughs> no, I don't want to say that. <laughs> but, but, but the point is, is that uh, they cooked, uh, they took care of their families, they were agrarian, just like New Mexico was agrarian, okay, and um, they stayed close to home. Um, and I'll show you pictures next time. Uh, the, they had no meat industry except maybe chicken, a few chickens. We brought 
cattle into Vietnam. We changed from soy to corn because you can't eat soy your whole life because it doesn't do well for you. Okay, and um, um, uh, we couldn't kill a cow. I'll, I'll show you a bunch of cows sitting right next to me that I would have loved to have killed. Okay, but they were sacred. All right. So the United States brought, especially into the highlands. Who mentioned the highlands before, or the mountains, or something? Anyways, yeah. Um, uh, so the Mountain Yards, who were mountain people, okay, were great farmers, and cattle was brought in up there. And today, if you go to Vietnam, you're going to see a thriving country uh, with a, a great piaster. The piaster is the currency of Vietnam. If I was younger, okay, this is not the have you guys leave the United States or nothing. But if I was younger, it would be a great opportunity over there because the, uh, the currency is uh, very strong. Uh, the government is very strong. It's one country in reality. It's not a communist country. Okay, so I'll stop it.